Today, I'm going to give you a bit more of a techy, nerdy overview of this soundproof garden room that we're building at the moment, and hopefully it'll answer a lot of the questions that have come up in the comments and whatnot. Hiya folks, welcome back to the channel. So, as you are aware, if you've already watched part one where I've given you a little bit of a tour of this soundproof kind of box that I'm building in our back garden. It is essentially a five meter by three and a half meter garden room, but the twist is that it's gonna be more or less completely soundproof. I'll go into that and the requirements of this project a little bit later. I'm gonna break this video down into three parts. First of all, I'm gonna go into why I'm building it where it is and kind of the location and size and whatnot. Then I'm going to go into the, the specs and uh, kind of the requirements of the build. And then I'm going to take you through some of the details of the build, covering off things like permitted development and building regs and various other aspects surrounding the whole soundproofing side of things. So first of all, as you are probably aware, this property has quite a big back garden. It's almost 50 meters long all the way down to a river at the bottom. It's not really shown on here, but there is actually quite a slope from the house side all the way down to the river. There's probably a good, I haven't measured it yet, but I'm guessing about a two meter drop from kind of grass level up here down to the river level down at the bottom. So there's quite a significant height difference. A few people have mentioned in the past, oh, is there a risk of sea levels rising and like environmental issues causing flooding and all that sort of thing. We are 50 meters above sea level here. So sea level doesn't affect this river height. What does affect this river height though is rainwater and it, it does swell in heavy rains. You know, it, it can only handle so much water at any one time and very occasionally it does break its banks a little bit. Now, from everyone I've spoken to, it's never come up more than about, well, not even halfway across the garden. So it's never come up to house level before. And that was in quite some major floods back in, I think it was 2008 and once in the 1940s or something like that. And also they've done various remedial like flood prevention works now on the river as well. So hopefully that'll never happen again. It's just, there's a bit of a bottleneck further downstream. So when there's really heavy rain, it basically rises quite quickly and then it falls quite quickly. I'm not gonna go into that in a huge amount of detail. All I'm gonna say is for that reason, I don't want to build anything right at the bottom here because if the river does flood i don't want to you know just common sense i, d I don't want to build so a permanent structure right at the bottom of the garden that has the potential of flooding so i'm just gonna play safe and not put the building any closer than halfway down the garden there's plenty room in the garden to build this structure so um it, it looks quite an ominous structure at the moment but really once everything's kind of cleared up and tidied up it's a, a tiny proportion of the garden space. It's like less than a tenth of the garden space. The other thing, and if you've watched the garden overview video, which I posted a little while ago, I'll include a link in the description, but it's over on the sunny side of the garden. And a lot of you will probably be thinking, well, why didn't you put it on the shady side of the garden? Because this little chart over here shows the tracking of the sun from sunrise over here all the way all the way round to sunset over here but if we were to put this room over on the right hand side it would mean that our view from the house or view from kind of the bifolds and whatnot would be of a great big shed and we didn't particularly want that so this is going to be kind of our view from the dining room and obviously it would be nice to have unobstructed views all the way down to the river so it just kind of made sense, you know, we'll sacrifice a little bit of the sunny side of the garden for the sake of not obscuring our views all the way down the garden from the dining room. So all of that kind of determined where it's gonna sit in the garden. And then obviously we needed to decide what sort of size it's gonna be. And that kind of conveniently leads me on to the specs or the requirements of this build. What's it actually gonna be for? And as I've mentioned many times before, I play the drums and I would like this to be a combined kind of studio space where I can get the drums set up and I can record because I've got other channels where I do drum related stuff on those channels and I need to be able to record my drums and I also want somewhere where I can work and do editing and recording voiceovers and things where I don't get disturbed by outside noises when I'm trying to do recording. 
So it stands to reason that it needs to be soundproof from the outside in and the inside out. So I've shown on here very roughly a drum kit more or less to scale just to get an idea of how it's going to fit into the room. We'll talk about the uh, secondary door and all that sort of thing later on but you can see there's plenty room for my kit and a desk any smaller and it's not really worth doing any bigger and I think it would take up too much of the garden so I think this is a reasonable kind of starting size and of course the final thing as well is that it needs to be built under permitted development because I just simply don't have time to wait for a planning application to go through because this needs to get built before we start on the main extension for the house because once the main extension's done it's going to be tricky to get diggers and equipment down to this end of the garden to build the studio room so therefore it made sense that we do this first and that means it needs to be under two and a half meters tall in the uk we have these permitted development rules to say you're allowed to build certain things in your garden without permission but there are quite strict requirements on what you can and can't do one of the trickier things in all of this is hitting the two and a half meter rule and that two and a half meter rule basically says that the building all the way up to the top of the roof can't be any higher than two and a half meters from the highest bit of ground where the building was originally built. So in a nutshell, it needs to be five meters by three and a half meters. It needs to have some views of the garden. If possible, it needs to be soundproof and it needs to be built under permitted development. So with all that in mind, I had a set of specs to give to a builder to basically say, can you build this for me? I want the whole thing to be built out of high density block work, cavity construction, insulated cavity, solid concrete base, obviously suitable foundations, etc, etc. I gave the builder kind of free reign on the size of the building and so that they could match it up to the nearest block size. So I basically said it needs to be minimum three and a half meters wide, minimum five meters long, but make it whatever size to make it easy on yourself for the block work. I wanted a 78 by 33 door, which is 1981 by 838 mil. With it being under one meter to the boundary, it means that the structure has to be substantially non-combustible, and that's for building regs purposes. I checked with building regs on that one, and they said that since it's more or less a concrete structure, they were absolutely fine with that, and it didn't need any form of building regs application. Obviously, I need some sort of window in the structure, but at the same time, windows are going to be a major source for sound to get in and out, so it's going to be quite a major weak point in the soundproofing. So I don't want too many windows, you know, if at a later date you wanted to turn it more into a kind of normal garden room, you could easily add a window into this wall here. But for the purposes of soundproofing, I'm keeping with just one window at the bottom overlooking the bottom of the garden. Generally speaking, for filming purposes, windows are an absolute pain in the neck anyway. And every time I'm filming, I'll be blocking out the window with a blackout blind because you need to be able to control the light. Let's just quickly talk about permit development rules in the UK since a lot of you asked about this. I'm assuming you don't live in a listed building, so here's my take on it. Please do your own homework to verify all of this. Here goes. You can't build in front of your house. You can't build anything bigger than 50% of the land around the existing house and it can only be single storey. You can't just build another house since it can't be self-contained living accommodation. It also can't have a microwave antenna for whatever reason. If it's within two meters of the boundary, it can't be any taller than two and a half meters measured from the highest bit of ground next to the building. If it's more than two meters from the boundary, it can be up to four meters tall for a dual pitched roof or three meters tall in any other case. In these cases, the maximum eaves height is two and a half meters. In terms of building regulations for outbuildings, providing the building has a floor area under 15 square meters and contains no sleeping accommodation, then building regs will not normally apply. If the floor area is from 15 to 30 square meters, then it needs to be at least one meter from the boundary or constructed substantially of non-combustible material. If you're building a wooden structure within one meter of the boundary, then you'll need building regs approval for this. And finally, of course, any electrics in a garden room must comply with part P of the building regulations, and that means you need a qualified electrician to hook things up and sign things off. There's a few more details you should read up on, so I'll include a couple of links in the description, but that's my take on it. Don't take it as gospel, do your own research, and post in the comments if you think I've got anything wrong. Okay, so we've covered where the studio room needs to go, how big it needs to be, and what needs to be done to make sure it doesn't need a full planning and building regs application. So finally, the big one. 
Soundproofing, and this is a topic where no matter what I say, it'll be wrong. I've spoken to multiple acoustic consultants over the years, and if there's one thing they have in common is that they never agree on anything. Soundproofing is an incredibly complex subject and has very little to do with egg boxes or acoustic foam. At the end of the day, effective soundproofing is a balance between cost, practicality, and the desired end result. Now, although I am technically a qualified studio engineer, I'm not an expert with acoustics. If you're planning on spending a lot of money on a project like this, then I would suggest you get this professionally designed by someone who knows what they're talking about. Definitely do not get your builder to design it unless they have a proven track record of similar jobs where you can check how well it actually worked. Anyway, I've been in enough recording studios and rehearsal spaces over the years to have a good understanding of what works and what doesn't work. Most drummers learn about this from a very early age when they're constantly told they can't practice since it's too noisy. Anyway, there are six areas I'm going to be thinking about in the construction of this soundproof garden room. The floor, the walls, the ceiling, the door, the window, and ventilation. The major weak points in all of this are likely to be the ceiling, the door, and the window, mainly since it wouldn't be practical to make any of those things out of concrete. So let's get geeky for a couple of minutes. You see, there are four essential principles of soundproofing. Mass, damping, decoupling, and absorption. Mass generally has the biggest impact on soundproofing since dense things are very good at blocking sound. The heavier your wall, the more soundproof it's likely to be, but it's not quite that simple. Damping is basically the act of deadening panels so that sound doesn't transmit through the various layers. Normally this is done using an acoustic sealant of some description. Insulation also has an important role to play in this regard since heavy walls can resonate and reducing this resonance can reduce the amount of sound getting through to your next layer. Decoupling is the act of separating structural layers so that flanking sound doesn't transmit through solid surfaces. This is why the traditional room within a room solution works so well, since the inner room is normally completely decoupled from the outer room. Another approach is to use things like resilient channel with special decoupling clips. And finally, absorption. This is your egg carton territory. Now, I hate to burst your bubble, but this has very little impact on actual soundproofing. The analogy I like to use here is a swimming pool. Indoor swimming pools are generally pretty soundproof since they're huge concrete buildings lined with ceramic tiles. Ceramic tiles are very dense and tend to reflect a lot of the sound back inside the building. The big downside to this is that the acoustics are awful since sound just endlessly echoes around the big shiny room. We control that reverberation through absorption and this is something I'll cover much later down the line when I'm ready to tackle the internals. One thing worth mentioning at this stage though is that parallel surfaces echo more. You can get a build-up of standing waves that can be really problematic at certain frequencies and that's why most recording studios aren't square boxes. For this reason I'm more than happy to have the internal ceiling following the slope of the roof since it will reduce standing waves between the floor and the ceiling. In an ideal world I would have had non-parallel walls but that would have added too much complexity to the build so I'll use other methods to control the acoustics later down the line. Anyway, enough of the theory, I'll show you my approach to this and then you can tell me how I'm doing it all wrong. In all seriousness, please do post constructive criticism but keep it polite because I'm pretty trigger happy on the delete button these days. Remember, I'm not saying this is the perfect way to create a soundproof building. This is just my approach, bearing in mind what I said earlier regarding cost, practicality, and effectiveness. So let's start with the floor. Just trust me when I tell you, in my experience, drums will be problematic on anything other than a concrete floor. The flanking noise from the instrument to the floor underneath is huge and easily transfers through wood to anything the wood touches. This isn't so much of a problem with concrete since most of the flanking noise is absorbed by the ground. If you're more concerned about controlling airborne sound, for example if you play the saxophone, then you don't necessarily need a concrete floor, but it will probably still help. But take it from me, as a drummer of 30 plus years, having your drum kit on a concrete floor makes a huge difference. So I've gone for a standard concrete slab with a compacted sub base, damp proof membrane, 100mm insulation, and 100mm of reinforced concrete. For the walls, I decided to go for a cavity wall construction using high density 7 Newton blocks. I'm not going to talk about the foundations too much since this will vary depending on soil type and whatnot. I left this to the builders but I think they were 600mm deep by 600mm wide. Considering our double skinned garage was built on 200mm founds and didn't budge in 70 years, I don't think this is going anywhere. 
and there was a colossal pile of topsoil left over from the foundation dig so do bear that in mind if you're going to go through this. We ended up hiring a mini digger and spread it out all over the garden and that's now a different problem for a different day. Also when the builders started constructing this they nearly put the damp proof course and floor level massively above the original ground level. This would have made the overall building far too tall so I got them to drop the floor level to below the original ground level and instead I'll just dig the ground down a little bit next to the building so there's still a 150 mil gap from the ground to damp. I can easily get away with this on a sloping site but this might not be an option if your garden is more level. This will all make more sense when you eventually see the finished building. The cavity is fully insulated and yes I'm having wall ties. I know the soundproofing nerds will go berserk over this due to the potential for sound to be flanked through the ties. I don't care. This is one of those examples where structural stability and practicality wins over creating the perfect solution. At the end of the day the walls aren't the weak point in this build. I'll deal with the internal walls once I know how soundproof the overall structure is. The external walls will be over battened and clad so technically there's at least four layers of materials with air gaps and insulation here. Trust me when I tell you it's not the walls that are going to be the problem here. And by the way why didn't I build the walls out of wood? Well firstly concrete is more dense and therefore generally more soundproof. Secondly to meet the building regs requirements since it's less than a meter to the boundary and thirdly for the flood risk side of things as well if there is ever any issues with flooding i figured a concrete building would probably be damaged less than a wooden structure so as you probably saw in the previous video the roof is made from pairs of c24 144 by 44 mil treated timbers a couple of you asked why i'm using treated timbers of c24 quality and in all honesty there was very little cost difference between this and C16 untreated timbers so it just made sense to pay a little bit extra for better quality wood here. A couple of you were concerned about flanking sound between the roof timbers and the outer wall plates but the roof sits on the inner leaf not the outer leaf. There is actually a gap between the roof timbers and the outer wall plate. The outer wall plate is simply there to make it easier to attach other parts of the construction and provide a nice clean edge for the soffits to butt up to. A couple of you asked why I'm using wall plates at all and yes you could probably get away with just strapping each joist pair directly to the wall but I was just more comfortable using wall plates and it meant that I could get the top wall surface perfectly level before putting the roof on. It also allowed me to add the extra plate at the front to achieve the required 80 to 1 fall. If I had more control of the builders I probably would have ditched the top layer of bricks at the front and had blocks instead with a single wall plate and that would have given me a better fall. I'm sure it'll be fine but if I get any sagging of the joists over the years I might end up with some pooling of water on the roof. We'll see, it should be fine. One thing worth mentioning though is that with this design you do end up with a gap around the sides of your room above the wall plate, just kind of here. I'm not sure how much of a problem this is likely to be but to be on the safe side I've fitted sound blockers which are basically 144 by 44 mil offcuts and it's just to block up that gap due to the fall of the roof. One really important factor in the roof design here is airflow. Since this is a cold roof there needs to be airflow from the front to the back inside the roof structure. That's why I had to go for slightly larger 144 mil joists since that gives enough room for the acoustic insulation over the ceiling and a decent size air gap above. It does however mean that the noggins running down the centre of the roof need to be slightly shorter to allow air to pass over the top of them. I just used offcuts from the 100 mil wall plates for this. There'll be vented soffits at the front and back so hopefully that should all work nicely. I'll talk more about that on a future video. For the roof itself, and I'm only showing a little part of it here, I'm using EPDM rubber over exterior grade hardwood ply. In all honesty I wish I'd gone for tongue and groove OSB since the ply thickness wasn't particularly consistent and that meant sanding down the joints so that there weren't any sharp edges for the rubber to sit on. I'll talk more about the ceiling on a future episode but... This will be run using decoupling brackets and resilient channel parallel to the existing joists so there'll be around a 5mm gap between the ceiling and the joist and this also negates any thermal bridging issues. The ceiling system will be two layers of sound block plasterboard possibly with tech sound membrane between the layers. The whole system will then be skimmed 
And as much as I like downlights, there won't be any downlights in the ceiling. It'll be a single undamaged system isolated with acoustic sealant around all of the edges. Acoustic insulation over the top, leaving the air gap I mentioned earlier for roof ventilation. I'm also going to put some extra acoustic insulation in the eaves at the side of the building since these don't need to be ventilated. And that basically leaves one problematic weak spot and that's that sound can escape through the front and back soffits. So I'm deliberately fitting oversized 175mm fascias, which I think will look better anyway, so that if needs be, I can remove the soffits, fit some 15mm sound block plasterboard in the gaps, somehow manhandle some insulation above the plasterboard, cut some holes in the plasterboard in line with the soffit vents, and then refit the soffits. I'm hoping that won't be necessary though. Before you ask about vapour barriers, I personally don't think they're necessary at all on this solution and they could actually cause more problems than they solve. You wouldn't normally have a vapour barrier on concrete walls like this and the roof void is fully ventilated anyway, plus it's a low occupancy space, plus if I use the text sound on the ceiling, I would imagine that would work as a vapour barrier anyway. Let me know in the comments what you think about this. For the window, I'm not going to use traditional cavity closers here since it could cause a flanking problem. Instead, I'm going to kill two birds with one stone and fit some 144 by 44 C24 timbers on the bottom and the sides. This will be on both the inner and outer leaves and should naturally leave an 8mm gap that can be filled with acoustic sealant. This will prevent any flanking across the cavity at the window and will also give a nice easy fixing point for the window itself. Obviously that timber will be covered up by the cladding once the building's all finished. The window will be triple glazed acoustic glass and if that isn't sufficient I'll add a second window to the inside leaf fitted at an angle to prevent standing waves building up between the two units. Again I'll start with a single window on the outer leaf and do some tests and if that's not sufficient then I'll add to it. The doorway is relatively easy to sort. There'll be a normal cavity closer since flanking in this area shouldn't be an issue and there'll be a heavy external door probably custom made since the builders made the door opening the wrong size and then there'll be a second internal door built into a soundproof partition. That should do the job absolutely fine. Again if sound is escaping through the doors I can operate the doors or operate the partition to suit. Finally, I'm probably going to need some form of ventilation and this is going to be one of the most complex parts of the build. I'll need to build some sort of MDF baffle box for both the inflowing and outflowing air. Not something I'm particularly looking forward to since it involves putting huge holes in my concrete walls, but I'll cross that bridge later down the line and with any luck, some of you lovely people will suggest some good alternatives. All I would say is I'm not going through the ceiling since I think that'll be detrimental to the overall system. And I think that covers most of the nerdy stuff. Remember, the building will be clad, so you won't even know it's made of concrete. I'm currently considering either render to match the render on the back of the house once the extension's built, some sort of composite cladding perhaps, such as cedral, which we might end up using on the house anyway, or red cedar if we can actually get hold of any, since at the moment there seems to be a global shortage of such things. Let me know in the comments what you think will look best. I'll also be breaking up the expansive walls with planting and natural materials to soften the whole structure, so it should look pretty good once it's all done. It'll take a while though, because at the moment work on the house is really taking priority. So I did promise, as a little extra bonus, I would let you know all of the heights and things that I've managed to get this building to. So the overall building height from the floor to the peak of the roof is 2,376 millimetres, so well under the 2.5 metre limit. The ceiling height at the highest point inside will be 2155 millimeters and bearing in mind that we've built this with the floor about 100 mil below the original ground level anyway technically the overall building height is 2276 millimeters which actually gives 224 millimeters to spare so if you really wanted to push the ceiling height you could do one extra block with a 9 mil mortar bed and that would take you to exactly 2500 millimeters but I don't suggest flying that close to the permitted development limits. Instead what I would do is swap the front briquettes for blocks and that would give you an overall height of 2426 millimeters at the front assuming you're happy to dig down a bit around the building to avoid bridging the damp proof course I think. 
please check my numbers. Anyway, let me know what you think. Don't forget to hit subscribe so you can see what happens next on this project and the main renovation work as well. It's going to take me a while to finish this since it'll be my temporary workshop while working on the house, so do bear with me. Any questions or comments, fire ahead below. Take care, folks, and I shall see you next time. Tatty bye.